dude, the intro just blows it away every time. Like I get all <laughs> I get all pumped up, like I'm gonna come in strong, and then the intro happens, and I'm just like, well, hi, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, how am I supposed to follow that? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, but hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Jason Downey. With me on my screen this way is Corey Overstreet. Uh, and we are doing a siege cast on physical test tactics. Um, you know, he and I just recently did a, a physical pen test together. Um, and we thought we would throw a bunch of our information together and, um, yeah, and kind of share with the class what we've learned. Um, so I'll go ahead and start us off, right? So let's talk about some recon, you know, the, the recon of what we do before we even hopped on a plane to go do our physical assessment. Um, and actually, let, let me take one step back. So for those of you that aren't familiar, uh, some of the aspects of our job is companies want to test, you know, the physical security uh, of their buildings. You know, they want to know, you know, can a person break in? Can a person, you know steal physical devices out or information or, 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 or and so forth and so forth. So that's that's kind of the, the gist of how we got here. So so recon, yes, before you jump on a plane, what are some things that you can and should do before um, before you actually get on site? Um, and one part is, you know, the first piece is almost like kind of your normal OSINT that you would do on really any external test. You know, you want to look at, you know, the, the company web page, you know, you want to try to pull down, you know, do they have any documents facing that tell you, you know, employee names or have metadata hidden or, you know, I know we, we've done some talks in the past that go way into detail on some sort of external OSINT. So I'm going to skim over that, but definitely the first step, any normal OSINT that you would do on any kind of external test. Uh, first thing that's unique to a physical is, you know, I, I remember Corey, like we spent, you know, almost like it was a couple hours like and we're looking at the like online maps right like we've got google street view you know we're using bing street view and we're like sort of casing the building you know walking around on google street view you know trying to figure out um you know what this building looks like you know we're looking for badge readers uh we're trying to figure out you know is like where is the ingress and outgress like you know fire escapes you know the main entrance um you know, is there parking lots, parking garages? Is there a place that looks like an employee smoking area, you know, that we can maybe once we get there kind of, you know, weasel all the way up to and act friendly with some of the employees? Is there is there a, a, a good lunch spot nearby? Is there like bars in the area that they may go to, you know, immediately after work? So those are some of the things that, you know, we, we looked for in those, you know, those online maps. Um. And once we kind of had sort of like a, a physical picture of the building, um, you know, we, we then dove into some different kind of like social media. You know, we wanted to look, number one, at the company itself, uh, the company web page. You know, what does the company web page say they're about? You know, what what is their industry? You know, how many employees do they have? Is this one building or do they have multiple buildings? Um, is the company, is there any news stories about them? Are they active in their community? Um, and all these things will help to, I'll, I'll talk about some pretext later, but all these things sort of play into that. It's like, what, you know, what's the company active in? You know, do they throw a parade that's coming up? Do they have events or something on site. And then what does their social media talk about? Like, you know, what, um, what's the company culture, you know, do, or do you see photos and everyone's in a suit and tie, or is it more of like, you know, was it more casual? Are they in, you know, t-shirts and their jeans? And is there, is there are a lot of people talking about, you know, working from home. So definitely social media, you know, on the company is, is a great place to look. Um, and then secondly, like, you know, also social media on employees, you know, in a sort of nature of social media is we all kind of overshare things, right? So if we can find employees, number one on LinkedIn, you know, get that list of these company employees. What are their positions? You know, what do they do? How long have they been with the company? You know, are they posting pictures of what it looks like inside the office? Are they sharing, um, are they sharing uh, like badge photos? You know, it's like, how many, how many times have you been on the internet and seen, you know, holy crap, I just got my new job. And it's a picture of somebody posing, you know, with their new badge. We could very easily screenshot that and copy it over. And now we have a copy of their badge, you know? Um, so yeah, and both companies and employees alike, you know, let's, you know, let's look for those pictures, you know, let's look for involvement with charities. You know, are they having an awards dinner? Is there, is there company events coming up? You know, what, you know, what can we look for that we might be able to use as a way of, of, of getting in later? Corey, did I miss anything? Is there anything you add or? 
No, no, that's that's perfect. Uh, that's that's all the things we usually look for. Nice. Cool. You know, and so you know, I remember, you know, so we, we 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 did ours and we you know, we did these things and we cased it out and you know the the you know, and our last one, you know, they were pretty they were pretty locked down on the internet. You know, we didn't find any of those gimmies as far as a free badge or anything. So, you know, when Corey and I landed, the first thing that we did is we started walking around the building, you know, and kind of our first goal was, do they have badges and what do those badges look like? And so we kind of walked back and forth you know, around lunchtime, you know, between their main headquarters and then like some some good looking lunch spots. And sure enough, like we were able to spot, you know, what their employee badges looked like because they all had them hanging from either their necks or from like something on their belts. Uh, so that walk around the building on the first day was, you know, our, our first little bit of recon before they had any idea who we were, before we even attempted anything. You know, we, and as creepy as it sounds, like, we hung out in the parking lot. You know, we looked to see, you know, were people coming in? Are there are there after hours cleaning crews? You know, where's the security guard? Does he do a walk around the building? Are there cameras? Um, these are all great things that you want to scope out before you try to do anything because all those things can get you busted so we wanted to be very very aware of you know cameras security guards uh and you know and so forth and so the main reason that all this recon needs to be done is because it helps you with what we refer to as a pretext and a pretext is um almost like a a story in advance of what you're going to to use to try to to work your way in and you know some examples of some good pretexts is you know you could pretend to be uh, any kind of like pest control. Um, you know you can be a, a maintenance worker. You could be a member of their cleaning crew. Um, you know that that cleans the building at night, or you're any kind of external contractor. Yeah, and the idea that uh, uh, you know it, it just flew across the screen there that a clipboard can get you in in, in into anywhere. Dude, props are everything. I'll tell a story here in a minute, but yeah, you know, hazard vest, ladder, clipboards, you know, people talk about those all the time, right? Um, but yeah, so some other building pretexts, you know, can you be some kind of technician? You know, in your recon, did you identify that they have like an external IT company? You know, and if you probably show up in a, in a polo shirt that you have, you know, printed with, you know, that external IT's um, like logo on it, they'll probably let you in the building because, you know, they see that name and they trust that. Um but some go-to pretexts, uh, yeah, just kind of some of these. Um, yeah, yeah, are you a partner? Are you a subsidiary? When you were doing your recon and looking at their website, is there a company locally that uh, that they partner with? You know, are, or do they have catering that comes in for an upcoming event that you could be a, a manager from that local uh, restaurant or establishment, right? Um, but so, you know, on our last one, Corey, so I talk about my favorite pretext, right? It's, it's got to be this one. And so really... This sort of stemmed from, you know, we looked at the company, you know, on LinkedIn, right? And we saw they had some job openings. Well, so I submitted a job application, you know, as as whatever. Um, and then I, lovely, thanks to LinkedIn, I was able to identify, you know, who their HR people were. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, so what happened was, uh, okay, so obviously I, I show up for an interview and I'm in a complete suit. Um, and like, because, I, yeah, uh, so I don't know if you, if you could flash that back, Jake, on, I would point out something, something kind of cool. If you look at that pin that's right there on my, I guess, my front pocket, that's actually not a pin, that's a camera. And so that actually actually recorded uh, the entire way in. But sort of the gist of that was after I had walked my way in, you know, pretending that I'm there for an interview, they're like, you know, we don't see you on the books. And the idea was Corey had put all this great work he's going to talk about next on about how to build like an implant device, like something that we could plug in. Uh, and I had took off because like, like, I'm in the building, you know, freaking out, you know, trying to calm my nerves. And so I go in the bathroom and as I'm sitting there like in a stall trying to figure out what to do next, uh, Tim uh, actually tags me, <laughs> actually tags me in, 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 in a in our team slack and is like hey you messed up on your expense report so yeah the idea is uh that feeling when your boss tags you on expense reports while you're in a bathroom true story 100 percent uh but yeah and so after i got out of the bathroom right i was able to sit back down um and i'm i'm literally sitting next to the security guard and i'm in the building for probably an hour like waiting for him to walk away so i can try to get somewhere 
the HR person that I said I had an interview with actually comes down and is like apologizing to me. She's like, we can't find your interview. You know, she's like, we're so sorry. You know, I'm like, oh, it's no problem. You know, I'm trying to get her to like, you know, show me around somewhere else, but you know, she didn't buy it. Right. But yeah, I'm so with a good pretext, you know, you can kind of talk your way in and literally like their employees are apologizing to me because they had messed something up and lost my interview paperwork. That's kind of how convincing a good, a good pretext can be. <clears throat> so, but yeah, so Corey, man, hop in with it. Tell us about some of the devices that you've, that you've built, um, and, and some cool, some cool tools that people can use. Yeah. So we'll, we'll cover some of the tools of the trade. Um, you know, it, in a lot of these instances, we do have clients that say we, we completely understand there's a big plate glass window in the front of the building. Like if someone was really going to steal something, obviously they could bust the window out and get in. We're looking for more, you know, white collar, somebody walks in, how can they, how can they subvert our physical security controls? Uh, and we never even knew they were there. Um, so a lot of the, a lot of the physical security comes down to bypass tools. Uh, one of the best sites to go to for, uh, these kind of tools is, uh, Sparrow lock picks. Uh, they, they have lock picking kits. Um, but one of my favorites, uh, that I was just recently turned on to is the, uh, Sparrow's mini gym. Um, it's just a flat piece of metal, uh, fits on your keychain. Um, but it can bypass most doors that use the, uh, the hook and latch. So you can kind of just slide it in between the door and the door jam, uh, pull in and it will get to the latch and kind of push it back into the door so you can open the door. Um, and then if they have them backwards, it also has a push part as well. <clears throat> Another great tool is an under the door tool. So most door handles, uh, in a, uh, corporate office setting, uh, have kind of the, uh, the long bar with a hook coming back towards the door. Uh, the reason they have this is because of the Americans, uh, with disabilities act. Uh, it may, it's a door handle that's more or less universally, uh, uh, usable by folks who have limited mobility in their hands, um, or, you know, just however they're opening the door. So the way the under the door tool works is, it's, it's a bar with a string and you slide it under the door, you bring it back up uh, so that it falls inside that hook. And when you pull the string, it kind of comes down over the door handle. And because the lock will disengage on the side that people should have been on, also due to fire code and stuff, um, you'll be able to pull the handle down, get the door open and walk right through. Another tool that we use uh, is a crash bar tool. So again, doors with the, the crash bar that you push in, if you can fit this bar between the doors and turn it 90 degrees, it has a hook on it that will grab the crash bar and pull it towards you, again, opening the door. Um, and then another uh, thing we run into are motion or heat sensors. Um, a lot of times you can look if they have like a glass door, you can just look straight through the door, look at the ceiling or look just a little bit past that. And there's usually some kind of motion or heat sensor on the ceiling or up close to the ceiling. Um, so easy ways to bypass these. Um, I've seen people use balloons. So you can literally stick a, a deflated balloon between the doors, blow it up and just let it go. And when it flies past, just keep pulling on the door till it trips. Um, another one I've personally used, uh, is a file folder, just a regular manila file folder, uh, because it's paper thin, usually it'll fit between the doors. You stick it in, just wave it around and <laughs> just wave till you hear the click and walk right through. Um, and what I've seen, uh, Devi and Alam use on YouTube is, uh, just a mouthful of alcohol. Uh, because the alcohol carries the heat, if you keep it in your mouth, you literally just spit it between the doors and it'll trip the heat sensor. <laughs> uh, looks like Tomcat says, what crash bar tool do you use? Um, I'd have to find the exact one, but it's basically, it looks like a coat hanger that kind of comes back to a little trapezoid hook looking and you literally just slide it through, turn it 90 degrees and pull and it will, it'll grab either the bar kind or the kind that have the, 
I, I don't know how you describe it, the flat bar that kind of pops back into the door. Um, but either one of those, uh, it, it's pretty simple to, to get past those. And just to reiterate, right, and so all these are non-damaging tools, right, Corey? Like none of them yeah. are going to leave any evidence that we were there. Yeah, and, and that's kind of the key here. Uh, like I was saying at the beginning, you know, most of these people are fully aware that breaking and entering as far as just destructive b &E is is it, it's always on the table. Um, but these are more covert methods of entry. Um, another tool we like to use is uh, USB drops. So just buy some cheap USB drives um, and throw malware or macro lace documents on there. Something that would entice the user to open it. So we would go to high traffic areas, you know, from our recon earlier. Uh, we would look for uh, places where all the employees are coming and going, uh, the smoking areas, like Jason mentioned, uh, the front door, uh, just out in the parking lot where you see the most cars parked. Um, and we'd walk around and try to get as brightly colored a USB as we can. And uh, we would throw whatever, um, whatever pretext we have on there, uh, usually something like uh, payroll or... Um, you know, passwords, something that would entice the user to open the document and then use uh, use the macros to kind of hide whatever information they think they're going to find in that document so that you can get them to go ahead and activate the document. At that point, you're just getting them to carry the payload into the building for you. Um, uh, additionally, if you do make it into the building, let's say after hours or even walking around uh, during office hours, a good place to drop those is around uh, printers, uh, copiers, uh, because someone will think, OK, well, they left it here. I wonder what's on it. And they'll carry it back to their desk and start, you know, again, trying to execute whatever payload you have. Another device is the rubber ducky from uh, Hack5. Uh, this is a device that uh, basically once it's plugged in, it's recognized as a keyboard and then you have pre-programmed steps for it to run through. Uh, and it'll type the commands or whatever it is you're wanting it to do to interact with the computer. It can type it faster than a human. So by the time it's recognized as a, a human interaction device or HID device, um, I mean, just two seconds later, it's ran 50 commands. You know, it, it can just type them, run through, and it can do anything you can do with a keyboard. Um, the only problem with them is they are a little pricey. Uh, so you don't want to leave these laying around a parking lot or, um, you know, leave it laying on a copier in the building uh, just because it's going to be very expensive to replace, you know, if you... Um, if you never get the device back after the test. So uh, a good alternative is the uh, the DigiSpark uh, AT Tiny 85 Arduino boards. Uh, these things, like I think I bought a pack of five of them for 20 bucks off of Amazon. Um, now they don't look exactly like your standard USB, but if you have access to a 3D printer, uh, you can easily 3D print a case around these things, uh, but they act exactly the same. And you can use the Arduino IDE uh, to program them uh, with these steps. So again, you know, make it something bright, throw it out, you know, and it's not a big deal if you lose them, but it has all the same functionality as the, the rubber ducky. And, and you made mention that they, uh, you call them like human like interface or interaction devices, right? So basically it, it emulates a keyboard. So yeah. if they had some kind of lockout policy saying you can't plug in a USB, uh, external USB drive, it would it would still accept it because it thinks it's a keyboard. Yeah, that that's a good yeah. point. So instead of trying to get them to look at a file on the on a, US, a standard you know USB drive, like Jason said, this is going to get recognized as a USB keyboard, which are rarely blocked. So um, and then it'll fly through all the actions. Um, we had set one up on the last physical uh, so that we did a little bit of a pretext calling to find out that they use Chrome. So since we knew Chrome was installed on their machine, uh, we knew that we could set this up to automatically launch Chrome, download a file, wait a couple seconds for it to finish downloading, and then execute the file using the, the run uh, option from the start menu. Uh, let's see. looks like somebody had a question. Do you do any 
Do you do any OSINT to find out what to change the BID PID bytes on the USB rubber ducky? Um, that I have not ran into. I've I've always just been able to uh, plug them in. Like let's say I gained access to the building, uh, plug it in, and it usually just works. Um, so I haven't ran into that, but that's that's a good point. Uh, I I need to look into that. And then I think we missed one. Uh, Quincy and Natuli had asked, you know, has COVID had any impact uh, in the ease of building access? So uh, actually, I was going to talk about that at the end of this section during story time. Um, but the place where uh, you saw Jason in his uh, in his suit during his interview, uh, they were actually under COVID protocols. <laughs> and that greatly limited uh, our access to the building because normally it's a building we were told by our point of contact. It's normally a building that uh, people come and go uh, that, you know, obviously there are some areas where, you know, the, the public can't just walk in and get to, um, but it was supposed to be pretty open. Uh, however, um, all of the doors were locked. You had to have an appointment to get in the building, uh, which kind of led to Jason's pretext. And, um, you know, it it really limited our chances of tailgating at that location, too, uh, just because they were kind of more alert that, um, that uh, unauthorized visitors needed to be going through the front door. Yeah, and with sort of the push of having more people work from home, you know, it, uh, it, it kind, that kind of plays in twice because you're not used to seeing as many people in an office, which, yeah, maybe this person normally works at home, but also they're not used to seeing you in the office. So they kind of ask that question twice, like, are you supposed to be there? You can, it can go both ways. Yeah, it really makes you stick out like a sore thumb. So that uh, that has been a pretty big hindrance with any kind of physical testing uh, during covid um, yeah, just limited amount of people. So you definitely uh, stick out a lot more and people can remember you a lot easier. Um, another device that we use um, is we've, we've created like a Dropbox. Uh, we take a Raspberry Pi, uh, install Raspbian on it. Um, and then so that in case they have any kind of strict egress filtering, uh, we use a... Um, we use a, um, a USB cellular modem so that we get some kind of backhaul back to our infrastructure and we can gain access back to that Raspberry Pi as long as it's online. Um, and then uh, ahead of time also, we configure an, uh, like network protection bypasses like 802.1x. Um, on this last one, so I had a Raspberry Pi with a USB Ethernet um, adapter so that it could sit in between a computer and the, the switch and could uh, allow the 8021x authentication to happen, but then kind of uh, piggyback on the connection once it's successfully made. And so all, and it uses the script that we were using um, kind of masks all of our actions to be coming from that machine as well. So it, it does Mac uh, MAC address cloning, and it uh, uses some IP tables rules to make sure that everything looks like it's coming from the, the legitimate machine on the network. Uh, Martin asked, what's your number one excuse for being there? Uh, that's usually content or uh, pretext dependent, um, but in the past, uh, being an IT worker is usually, uh, usually the number one. Uh, otherwise, you can just play dumb. <laughs> you can literally just say, oh, I'm sorry, I was looking for the bathroom. I just started following this person until I found the bathroom. Um, you can, uh, you, I've never used it before, but I have heard people say that they've, they've actually just claimed to be in the wrong, uh, the wrong company's building. <laughs> so it's, but usually it does come down to your pretext. So if you got in the building under an interview, you can just say, hey, I was looking for the bathroom. Uh, if you come in as an IT person, you can just say, yeah, I'm supposed to be here fixing the phones because, I mean, there's going to be a phone everywhere, you know. Um, the final tools that I wanted to talk about were badge cloning. So if the street view maps are clear enough, sometimes you can figure out what kind of badge reader they have on the wall. Uh, a lot of times, though, they're not they're not 
that clear. So, um, but the, you know, pretty much the, the best tool for cloning badges, or at least the original, would be the Proxmart. Uh, this tool, uh, basically, if you get, as long as you get close enough, uh, it will read the badge just like a regular, like a standard badge reader, but it'll record it. Uh, it'll record all the information from the badge and it will um, make it so that you can clone it back to a blank badge. Um, and what what's great about that is really, like uh, Jason was talking about earlier, if you're walking around the building, if you go to a restaurant or a, a common dining area in the uh, company space, as long as you can just make an excuse to walk close enough to them with this active in your pocket or like a carrier bag, some some kind of uh, reason to have this thing out. Uh, you can clone a badge, clone it back to a blank, and now you can walk around the building uh, as if you know you're an employee. Um, another thing uh, I've done in the past is taking once you get a picture of their badge, you can clone that to um, to and and put like a sticker on top of the blank badge so that it makes it look even more legitimate. The only problem with the Proxmark, though, is you've got a range of maybe six to eight inches. Like it's you have to get really close to get a badge read. Um, but yeah, you're not getting by any hugs during COVID. Like that wasn't <laughs> going to work out. <laughs> no, no. Um, but uh, there are some uh, there are some alternatives. So you can build your own. Um, uh, there's a uh, a setup called the We Gotcha. Uh, it's kind of a play on the word wagon, which is the protocol that these badges use. And the way it works, you use a Raspberry Pi and you um, you hook it up to a real badge reader, but one of the really large ones. And with that and a battery pack, you can literally, you, I think you can be up to two or three feet away, which is pretty impressive for RFID. And you can get a badge read that way. Um, from the guys that I've talked to that do a lot of physical testing, uh, they they say that that's usually their go-to. Uh, one, uh, for just the, the sheer amount of range, but two, it's also a lot cheaper to build one of those. Uh, once you buy the, the battery pack, the antenna, and the Raspberry Pi, well, you know, except for during a chip shortage, <laughs> um, it's it's way cheaper than the Proxmark. However, you do have to know that it's working ahead of time. So you have to have some way to test these cards uh, before taking it out in the field. Um, and then another good tool is the RFID diagnostics tool from Dangerous Things. So the, this card, all you have to do is walk up to a badge reader uh, on your target's building, hold it up, and it has two LEDs on it. Um, one will tell you if it's the low frequency, the 125 kilohertz type cards, or if it's the uh, the higher, uh, the was it 3.56 megahertz cards, um, and it'll it basically you just hold it up to it and the light will light up. The only problem you can run into, like we did on this past test, is if they have um, if they have a hybrid system. So a lot of times when companies are transitioning from the low frequency to the high frequency, um, they will buy badge readers that read both just so that they can support during the transition. The high frequency cards have more security built in where you can have a secondary pin. Uh, so uh, a lot of times, but they don't want to give up the low frequency cards until everyone has had a chance to get those switched over. Also, there's a uh, Tomcat just posted where there's a uh, another field detector card as well. Let's see, is weight volume ever a thing? So, it when I was uh, bringing a lot of these tools, I of course I had to check a bag as well, um, but a lot of times these tools can be used in phases. So you're not going to carry everything on site your first day. You know, when you're doing your recon for what kind of badge readers they have, that could be as simple as just keeping the card in your pocket. Um, now, when you are planning on making a move and trying to get into the building, 
then yeah, you, uh, a lot of these things will fit in a standard book bag uh, or you know maybe a standard uh, computer bag. Uh, but you kind of have to pick and choose what you need and then kind of keep the rest back back in your home base so that you can go back and kind of make the things that you need for your next attempt. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, I know there was a lot of tools that we took, but, you know, most of them are, you know, they're, they're credit card size or USB size or they, they as, as all individual tools could fit in your pocket. You know, even that that the implant that you built, you know, with it being a Raspberry Pi, an external battery and, you know, a USB um, uh like a cellular modem. Cellular modem. <laughs> um, you know, that was still small enough to where I could fit it in a suit pocket. Not exactly comfortably, but it was still in there. You know, so a lot of this stuff isn't very large for us to take on engagements with us. Yeah. Yeah, and that's right, Tom. Okay. It, the, the big thing is, uh, so our point of contact gave us a, a couple of hints before we got on site, but a lot of our recon, too, kind of narrowed mm -hmm. things down as to what we may need. You know, when you look at the types of doors that they have, uh, do these doors have the ability to slide something under the door like an under-the-door tool? You know, it, um, if they have the pr protections in place to keep you from putting anything under the door, or if they have the, the latch covers for uh, beside the door handle, you know, a lot of these bypass tools aren't going to work in those situations. You have to, you can kind of narrow down your, your uh, tool set at that point. Yeah. And, and another thing to consider, right, is you're not when you, when you make a move on a building, you're not making just one move. It's not like you're walking up and you're, you know, you're, using every technique that you've got you know ideally you know you might change an outfit and come back later or or maybe you shave and, and cut your hair which is actually when you tell your story right like well we'll get to how i did it but um yeah so if you think about it like you, you carry a pocket full at a time do a little bit of recon on site come back the next day you know with something a little more advanced or a little bigger or a little more uh, i guess direct of what you need yeah and and uh to jason's point we do try like I, I typically let my hair grow out a little bit. I let my beard grow down. Uh, I'll bring hats. Um, and then if I do get not necessarily busted, but if I do get where I've, I've kind of got their attention, I can just go back to the hotel room, shave my beard, uh, maybe slick my hair back or throw a hat on or something. And I look completely different. Um, and that was uh, something we employed on this last one a little bit as well. Um, but the final tool I wanted to talk about uh, were the ESP or the BLE keys. Um, so these tools, what they do is you take the badge reader off the wall and you find the two data wires, the power and the ground uh, for the badge reader. And uh, you either use vampire clips, uh, you splice the wires in, uh, whatever you need to do. But it basically sits on the wire behind the badge reader. So any badge reads that come in, because those wires are being activated, it will passively collect whatever authentication happened. So if um, now the difference between the two is the ESP key uh, has a, a local area Wi-Fi network that you can connect to. So you should be able to connect from up to, you know, 30, 40, 50 feet away, as long as the wall or the badge reader isn't blocking the signal. And you can download these to clone to a card, or when you walk up, you can actually connect to the Wi-Fi uh, and tell it to replay the badge read and just walk right in. Um, now the BLE key is the exact same, except it uses Bluetooth low energy. Um, so as long as you can connect over Bluetooth again, you can just tell it to redo or resend the uh, the badge read and you're in. Uh, for newer cards like the high frequency, uh, that have a pin, you can actually brute force the pin as well. Uh, so you can tell it to do a, a pin brute force and it'll remember what pin worked for it. And now when you replay it, you're just walking right in again. Um, now, uh, so for story time, uh, I will talk about, so Jason made it into the building, right? Under the pretext of, a, of an interview, but we were having a lot of trouble getting back in again. Um, and because of people coming and going so infrequently since the, the on-site uh, staff was pretty low, um, we thought, okay, well, maybe we need to try and, and backdoor this with a, an ESP key. Well, 
so our point of contact told us and we confirmed once we got on site they had 24 7 guards uh who regularly patrolled the grounds um and additionally they had uh they were having after hours events um the whole time we were there so during the after hours events we noticed that the guards were kind of uh they had more on-site security i guess because they were going to have people who didn't work there and they had to make sure that they stayed where they were so uh after after we tried the interview thing we were trying to figure out when the best time to go uh use the or install this esp key so that we could uh get some badge reads we also had the problem where their badge readers wouldn't tell us if they were low or high frequency so again we had trouble cloning badges um so that was why we went this route well we tried to pick a time we figured if we went at night the security guards don't have much going on, so we're going to stick out like a sore thumb walking up to a, a door with a camera on it uh, to um, to backdoor this thing. Because, I mean, obviously it takes a few minutes to get this thing off the wall and get it installed. Well, so we picked middle of the afternoon thinking, you know what, this will be the time when the security guards just basically watching the clock, waiting to go home. He's probably hanging out, talking to other people at work. So <laughs> with... The camera on the door we had jason uh open an umbrella walk up and just kind of hold his umbrella so it blocked all view of that door and then i wore uh, a polo and some khakis made it look like i was a, a, a security technician and basically just took the it, it's one screw to get it off the wall was pulling it out but the particular model that they used, the wiring was actually way further back in the wall. So I'm like fishing this wire out. Well, I guess the security guard noticed that the uh, that the camera was blocked. So he came to investigate. And uh, yeah, needless to say, he walked out, questioned me. I tried to talk my way out of it, but he uh, he wasn't buying it. So after he watched me put the uh, the badge reader back on the wall, uh, I had to give him my letter, my get out of jail free card. Yeah. So let's see. Would you try accessing a building where there are twelve work spots and a general reception, or is that a no go? So you mean like kind of a small office space, Martin? May take a while. Yeah, maybe a bit of a delay while he gets the oh, answer okay. back to you. Well, <laughs> so yeah, if I'm understanding correctly, it, a pretty small office space. Yeah, so I have actually been in a pretty small office space like that. Um, typically, as long as you can, as long as you can come up with a pretext that makes it believable while you're there. Um, yeah, I've. So one of the physicals I've been on in the past, um, they had. They were in a multi-tenant building, but they also owned office spaces on four different floors. They didn't own the whole floor. There were multiple companies on every floor, but for whatever reason, they had just kind of office spaces spread out. So in those cases, you kind of have to get an idea of where you're going to land when you do tailgate in or bypass a door. Um, but in those cases, yeah, I've, I've just walked in. Uh, and if, if I got questioned, I always made up an excuse to get out of there. Uh, but so with that, I'll turn it back over to Jason. Um, actually, do let's grab this. What are some of the more challenging everyday security features? Door handle shrouds. Conversely, what are some of the large or least secure security elements that are generally accepted as secure? Locks. Um, All kinds of locks. Yeah, padlocks yeah. especially. Um, I've seen. Um, I've seen actual phone closets that were accessible externally with nothing more than a master lock on it, um, which had direct lines to their um, to their uh, server room and no cameras on the door. I mean, you just take two wrenches, put them in there, and kind of torque it out, and it's the lock's gone. Yeah, yeah. Man, man traps that are three feet tall that you know any person <laughs> can just jump over or like walk through, anyways. Yeah, yeah. man traps. Yeah, and, and with man traps too, you know, 
uh, like I was talking about with the motion sensors, you literally just stick a file folder through the door and wave it around, and now it's no yep. longer a man trap. So, <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, yeah, I guess a, that's a perfect segue to talk about, uh, I guess, different methods of entry, right? So you've done your recon, you know, you've got all your cool tools built. Now, how exactly do you get them into the building? You know, uh, you know, and, and the first part that I want to touch on is being able to build that confidence because, you know, that's so key. If you walk in there sweating, someone's going to look at you funny. So the first thing, you know, Corey touched on it a minute ago, the first thing you need to build confidence is have a get out of jail free card. And so number one, that get out of jail free card is kind of your written permission to be there and it keeps you out of jail, you know, should someone call the police on you. But number two, it kind of, you know, you're not going to get in trouble. So what do you have to worry about? Like you get to go on in with your get out of jail free card that you can kind of within reason do or say anything and get in. And if you get caught, you know, you kind of, you get caught, you just kind of like walk out to the car with a sad face. Like there's no, you know, there's no, there's no, uh, catastrophic events that come from getting caught. So that helps to build that confidence. Um, another part is a, a fully well researched pretext. You know, when we talked about, you know, my, my interview story a minute ago, right. You know, I knew who the person in the building was that was going to interview me if I showed up for an interview. You know, I knew the job position that they had open. You know, I knew some of the other employees and manager names that worked sort of in that, um, you know, in that area of their business, right? So I was able to walk in and confidently say, my interview is at this time with this person and then be like, Okay, I'll call them. So much so that that when that when that person came down to greet me, they actually apologized to me for losing, you know, my interview time. Right? It it was it was such a well researched pretext that even though I knew I wasn't supposed to be there, they assumed that I was. Uh, you know, the last part, you know, it, it, for that building that confidence is like really dressing up and getting into the part. You know, early on, you know, someone mentioned, you know, carry the clipboard, carry the hard hat, um, but really like. You know, use your props, you know, use something that shows that you're supposed to be there, whether it's a shirt that's got a, you know, a logo on it or, you know, some kind of, you know, emblem or, you know, a badge that's a clone of what their badge is or a badge that just looks like their badge where somebody in passing would just look, you know, really, I guess, get into your pretext. You know, you can't just show up, you know, in a Red Siege t-shirt and expect somebody to let you in the door. Um, yeah, so dress the part. Uh, the second piece is, is physically getting into the building, you know, and we call it tailgating, which is basically where you follow someone else into the building. And even on our last one, you know, the front door was locked and the way that I got in was, you know, I kind of stood there on the phone, somebody walked out, I immediately just grabbed the door and walked in. You know, once I was kind of in there for a minute, you know, I'm in I'm in a full suit. No, no one no one really questions me being there because it's not like I'm dressed to do something crazy. Like I'm in a suit. Who causes problems in the suit? So, yeah, tailgate someone in. Um, some some good high times for that are kind of at like the open and close of business. You know, people are coming and going pretty often. And then around like your lunch times, you know, because if you're standing outside of a main entrance door at 115, you know, you've probably already missed lunchtime and maybe you get like an afternoon smoke breaker. Uh, but more than likely, um, you might be standing outside there for a little while waiting for someone to let you in. And the longer you stand there, in a sense, the more suspect you look, but also that confidence will start to get rattled because you're you're thinking about it, you know, as opposed to just getting right in and, and getting going. You know, and then also, you know, we talk about props, right? Like if you're just trying to get in the building, if you've got a handful of like four or five boxes of pizzas or some donuts or something, you know, or even, you know, maybe like a briefcase, anything that you've got that have your hands full that show that you can't open the door by yourself, people naturally want to help other people, right? So they see you, they see you struggling, and maybe you act like you're going in your pocket looking for a badge that you don't actually have, and they just grab the door for you and, and let you in. So tailgating, one of the great ways that um, that, that we get in. Uh, question, how much time do you do internal stuff? You say you're there for an interview, so possibly is someone coming for you? Uh, what do you do, and is it before or after? Um, if I if I, if I I think I understand your question. So it really kind of depends on the job, you know. In in this kind of scenario, because they were so locked down, all the buildings were locked, and you know we knew they had on-site security. The percentage of recon 
was very high versus the amount of time that that we spent internally uh you know actually trying to you know to get stuff plugged in or grab a machine or or, or do whatever um you know in a different scenario if you're able to get early and easy access to the building you're going to spend more time in there you know actually you know doing the hacking portion or getting something set up or plug something in um and then ideally you know, the reason that we built that implant device is once that we're in and we've got something in there and good to go, you know, then we can get out, you know, because if we can access their network remotely, you know, via our, 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 our Dropbox tool, you know, then why stay in there and risk getting caught? Like, let's go back out, let's go back to the hotel or, you know, out to the a van the, out somewhere and let, let's hack from there, you know, let's see how far we can get going that way. Uh, what flags or goals do you set? L let's come back to that question. Let me copy and paste that. That'll be a good. We got a lessons learned section. We'll we'll come back to your your question. Um, so yeah. So after tailgating, you know, we talked about you know all this cool stuff that clones badges. You know, and so when you've got a cloned badge, um, you know, one thing is you want to kind of have like a predefined goal. If you if you're going in the building with potentially with potential full access or limited access, like, you know, what are you trying to get? Are you trying to get into a server room? Are you trying to plug in an implant device? Are you trying to physically pick something up and carry it out? Are you trying to just do recon? Like you just, do you just want to see the lobby? Do you just want to count security guards or cameras? Um, yeah. And you want to try to do that at, at high traffic times, you know? So, um, if everyone's at their desk at one o'clock and you're the only person up walking around, you're going to be easier to, to spot and pick out. So, you know, 9.05 when everyone's shuffling in, you know, 11.55 as people are starting to pull right in and out for lunch. You know, those are times that you can kind of be up and walking around and not, you know, stick out like a sore thumb. Um, and then if you can, and then if you know the layout of the building and you can kind of know your way around, at least mentally before you get in there, you know, that, that helps a lot for those sort of clone badge, um, I guess, methods of access. And so last part, you know, is, you know, we talk about physicals and methods of entry. There's also the wireless network, you know, so just because a, a box is physical, right, you know, doesn't necessarily mean you have to be inside of it in order for, uh, for you to be able to exploit it. You know, if you even think back to, I think it was Home Depot a couple years ago, right, where, you know, they had this huge breach. And the way that they got breached was there was a guest Wi-Fi network that wasn't actually segregated from their main network. And so like some literal kids were sitting outside in the parking lot from a Home Depot, you know, public Wi-Fi or guest Wi-Fi and were able to connect into their, you know, corporate headquarters and, and, and dumped a bunch of data. Uh, so if that's something that we can do on a, on a physical test, we're, we're certainly going to try it. And even if they don't have like a fully open and accessible guest Wi-Fi, like there's a couple attacks that we're going to try. You know, we're going to do, um, you know, what's called like an evil twin attack where like, let's say they have something called Red Siege Wi-Fi. Like that's the, that's their SSID of their wireless network. If I set up sort of like a rogue access point that's also called, you know, Red Siege Wi-Fi, um, and, and I can present them with a login portal, you know, their computer's automatically going to connect to what they consider to be what it considers to be the strongest access point. So if there's two access points and I'm here and their closest corp one's way over here, they're going to try to connect to me, but I'm just a pretender. So I'm going to present them with their login page and then they're going to, you know, give me my credentials or I'm going to, um, you know, in, in, intercept some stuff and crack and so forth. But ultimately we try to do that sort of machine in the middle style evil twin attack to, to get access to corporate Wi-Fi that way. Uh, and then lastly, if, if they've got a corporate Wi-Fi uh, with Radius, and what Radius does, it's a way for uh, access to um, use Active Directory for authentication. Like you could actually do password spraying, uh, you know, through through like a, a Wi-Fi access portal or any sort of like external auth portal. So we look for that kind of stuff on on to do those Wi-Fi attacks as well. Cool. Yep. Yeah. So what? Once we're in, what? What? Let, let, let's say we, we tailgate it in. We've got a cool device. You know, what are we doing, Corey? What's next? So, uh, typically, once we get in, if you're trying to stay in for as long as you can, then you're going to look for a place to either hide out or kind of acclimate, kind of settle down. You know, your adrenaline's pumping. You're trying to make sure that you're not sticking out while also, you know. <laughs> <laughs> working towards uh you know where you want to be um easy places to take a drop box would be a conference room 
Um, a lot of time they have Ethernet ports all over the room, uh, especially if there's some kind of furniture near one. You can just kind of tuck the um, the drop box in behind that and you're good to go. Walk out. You're done. Uh, another place uh, to go would be um, would be if they have any kind of personal uh, phone rooms. Uh, I've seen where they have it's not necessarily a conference room, but it's just a room with a small table and one chair for someone to take a phone call while they're on site. Uh, another place would be uh, the break room. Seriously, walk in the place, pour yourself some coffee, you know, calm down, eat, eat some of their snacks, like, you know, be an employee. That's, that's literally why you're there. You are one of their employees, if that's your pretext. Um, another good spot, if you can spot it, if they have kind of an open floor plan, or if you're just walking along and you notice uh, an unused desk, uh, I've seen plenty of places with cubicles where you can literally just walk in, sit down, kind of, you know, get your bearings and then see if there's an active Ethernet port under there. Plug in, you know, stand up, walk out. Um, and then another place that uh, I've had a lot of success with, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute, uh, fire escape stairwells. So let's say you tailgate in. Uh, you know, there's a public access hallway that like once you come in through the main door, there's a lot of other doors with badges. Um, we would like to go in and uh, put kind of tape that we call it tape in the doors. You take some duct tape or some kind of packing tape and put it over so that the latch never goes back into the thing. And that way the doors just basically push open at that point. Um, but with fire escape stairwells, uh, I've, I've seen it where, um, the fire escape stairwell had a badge to get in, but it doesn't have it coming out uh, just because of fire code. Uh, so, you know, wait, basically wait around in the stairwell until someone comes out during lunch or leaving at the end of the day, tape the door and then go to the very top of that stairwell where there are no offices at, uh, and basically just camp out until, you know, it's after hours. Um, and another way, uh, once you get in, let's say you come in, it's a uh, standard office, they close at five. Uh, the, you notice that the cleaning crew is coming in every night, seven, mm -hmm. seven thirty. A lot of times they leave the front door open uh, while they're carrying all their stuff in. So if you can show up and look like an employee with a badge or, you know, for whatever reason, you can literally just walk in and then ask them, hey, um, I left my keys at home. I left my card at home. Is there any way you can let me into this room? And nine times out of 10, they have keys to everything except maybe like the server room um, where they can just let you in. Uh, so kind of as I've been alluding to, I um, had a physical one time. It was a multi-tenant building. Um, and uh, they had the areas on all, all these different floors. Well, we managed to get into the main um, the main lobby of their main room, the, basically the place that their clients would come where their reception was at and everything. Uh, we waved the folder around through the glass doors, got in. So while we're waiting, uh, we're trying to go around the building and get around, but there's, there's key card access on all the major wings in that area. Uh, and we couldn't get around those doors. They had the the latch guards. They had the uh, the scrub guards at the bottom of the door and stuff. Um, so while we were waiting, we ordered a pizza. And we're basically sitting in the lobby uh, eating dinner trying to figure out how we're going to get around. And the cleaning crew shows up. And we ask them, we're like, hey, you know, we're supposed to be doing some overnight updates. You know, can't have any downtime. And, uh, you know, but we we left our badges at home. We've got a badge to get in the front door, but we couldn't, We, for whatever reason, we can't get in these other areas. And so the cleaning crew was kind of like, yeah, sorry, you know, I'm, I'm gonna need to see some ID. And we were like, well, I, you know, I left it at home. So they start going around the building. And when they come back, we're like, hey, we've got this pizza left over. I mean, do you want any before we leave? We're just gonna throw it away. And the guy said, I'll tell you what, yeah, give me some of that pizza. Here, I'll just go ahead and let you in. We're getting ready to leave. So we got past uh, all of those things, and we actually managed to make it into the server room because the cleaning crew led us into the, the areas around that because the server room didn't have 
very much protection at all. Yeah, and it lets you in because you gave them pizza. I mean, that's even... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's quid pro quo at that point. It's like I scratch your back, you scratch mine. Um, let's see. Martin said, uh, "Would you do this scenario? Hi, I'm the printer man. Uh, shows card. Ask for the Wi-Fi code because your bundle is drained for downloading drivers. So um, I haven't done that particular scenario, but I have." Uh, if they are a company that has multiple satellite locations, uh, it's usually safe to assume that they have IT services that kind of come around and go between the buildings. So I have made it in by just, you know, going up to the front desk and saying, look, I left my badge at home or my badge isn't working, you know, have some kind of badge that's making the thing beep, but it's obviously you know, not legitimate and say, I don't know what's wrong with this stupid thing. Can you just let me in? And a lot of times people there will be like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Just, you know, here. So <laughs> I, I had uh, in the past, I had one at a doctor's office where they had multiple locations and we had a hotel key card that would make their badge readers beep. And we literally just kept that in a lanyard with a fake badge and you could walk up to doors and it looked legit, but it wouldn't let you in anything. So the other employees would. So uh, I guess, uh, you know, it's, it's good to talk about all these things and talk about how, uh, how we're bypassing these controls, but we also kind of want to talk about some of the lessons learned. Um, so, you know, as Jason was talking about in the beginning with recon, you know, pay attention to what's online. If, if you're on the blue team trying to make sure these things don't happen to you, um, you know, pull up Google Maps, pull up Bing Street Maps. Literally, you can just walk around your building and zoom in. You know the building better than any stranger would. So look for those points of entry. Look where suspicious people may be hanging out, waiting to tailgate in, you know, and if there are ways to limit these uh, these access points, you know, definitely kind of talk with on-site security or talk with management and see if there is a way to either step up security around those points or eliminate them altogether. Yeah, and and you know when you know, you know there's been some past talks we we've talked about those OSINT right like like check out those talks and read about those tools that 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 we give out there and then run them yourself you know you know find out what documents are available on your company's you know external facing website and then download them all and see if there's metadata you know see if there's usernames see what it gives away you know do all of those things. Yeah, uh, another big one. And educate your employees on keeping badges out of sight. Now, when they're walking in, a lot of times security guards will have requirements that they are showing a badge when they walk in, but they don't need to be showing that when they go out to lunch. You know, when, uh, on the last physical we did, we would literally just walk around the building and Jason would walk up to somebody and kind of, you know, like, hey, I'm trying to find this company or I'm trying to find this, this uh, restaurant. And they would stop and start pointing around. And we literally just took our phones and took a picture of their badge because it was hanging off their belt or it was hanging around their neck. You know, just educate them that they don't have to necessarily move it around, but keep it somewhere where it's not necessarily just right out in the open. Um, also, educate your employees about confronting strangers. Like, they don't have to be mean about it. They don't have to be hyper vigilant. But, you know, if something don't feel right, a lot of times, you know, just just a quick, simple, hey, how you doing? Uh, can I help you find something? Just, you know, uh, question them with a smile. Um, most of the time, 99% of the time, those people are supposed to be there. Um, but if, if, your company doesn't have any kind of way of indicating that from a distance, then, you know, just train your employees. It's okay to walk up and say, Hey, can I help you? You know, can I help you find somebody? Um, just make sure that if someone, an unauthorized individual is in the building, that they're at least confronted by someone who works there, making sure that they are supposed to be where they are, um, you know, or just notify on site security. Uh, and then kind of as, as some of the people in chat have, have indicated, you know, implement USB d device restrictions um, that uh, as far as whitelisting uh, the um, the IDs for those devices, that's that's a great idea. Um, unfortunately, I haven't really ran into that, but that that is a great way to um, to limit the uh, the effectiveness of rubber duckies or these USB drops. 
Uh, yeah, go on. yeah, so Jay, yeah, Jay Khan just threw that question up, and I want to combine it with a question early on, too. So there were two questions. First one was, no client likes a pen test report of here's how we pwned you. Uh, with that in mind, once the engagement is over, what do your vulnerability mitigation recommendations look like? And then also, what flags or goals do you set with the customer as criteria for success? So in my mind, those are actually the same thing because, yeah, you know, we have to write a report showing a methodology saying, hey, this is how we got you. But that report is also a chance to uh, call out all the things that they, that they did well. You know, hey, you know, we were able to do this, but we weren't able to get in with this. So good job there. Keep doing that. And then ideally, you know, we could also, you know, wrap those back around to the flags or goals that we talked about with our client in advance. You know, if they if they tell us, you know, hey, we've just hired a new physical security company, like a new you know, on-site security guard, and we want to know how well they're doing. You know, then then we write to that. You know, we want to show how well that that team did. You know, if they just installed new locks for the server room, you know, we're going to test those and we're going to make sure that we write that value that they're asking for. Yeah, our our reports are not. We try not to write them in a punitive way. We we're not trying to punish anyone. We're trying to say, look, you know, shore these holes up because if I can do it, someone else can too. But it, you know, we're never trying to, you know, penalize somebody for either lack of education on that particular subject or, you know, just because we got lucky. You know, we we're more or less saying this is what could happen. But here's the ways you could mitigate that so that it, it it's much more difficult or impossible in the future. Uh, Quincy had a question. What's the type of facility that you won't touch, like health, nuclear, chemical, penitentiary, as it relates to personal risk or reputation? Uh, typically, I, I do not want to do anywhere the guards carry guns. <laughs> um, or, you know, I, I would say... You know, government facilities are usually like federal government facilities are extremely locked down and they don't play. Uh, they, you know, I would hope that my skill set and my practice level at these things are top notch before I'd be approaching uh, one of those. Um, and nuclear, the probably. Go, 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 go. I was just going to yeah. say anything where if we do something kind of risky it, it may cause problems for a lot of other people yeah yeah so the only i I, mean, I agree with you 100 percent. the only thing i would add is me personally i will lie to anybody that you all hire me to lie to so <laughs> bring up all the clients i might not do great but i'm gonna try so um and so just to throw it out there if you're if you're interested in what you've heard and you want to learn more um so there is a company, the Red Team Alliance. Uh, they have trainings on uh, different methods of covert entry, uh, different methods of bypass for alert, uh, security systems. Um, and one of the guys that works there, DB and Alum, um, he has a lot of YouTube uh, videos out there as well. Uh, he he talks through lock picking. He talks through. Um, different uh things that he carries every day that if if he were put in the situation of being able to break into a place it's just natural that he's already got these things ready to go um i mentioned him earlier when he was he was showing how easy it was to get in through this heat sensor that he could just identify by looking uh blowing alcohol between the doors and just boom he's in this bank after hours um and then finally, uh, the not so civil engineer. Um, so this channel, uh, they cover a wide range of things from OSINT, social engineering, physical security testing, and a lot of their information is is pretty accurate for things that that we've done as well. Um, going back to Deviant, if you look for some of his talks too, uh, he has a lot of talks about. Um, about physical security and he even has somewhere he just tells stories about how he got into some of these places so definitely check those out and if you guys have any other resources i'm uh, i'm or we're definitely interested Well, Jaycon, if you're out there, I think that Jaycon is right? always out there. He is always watching. He's always listening. He's always uh, flying pictures of you hiding in a bathroom. Like that's true. You know, you, you, sometimes you just got to have it ready and on deck uh, to fly, <laughs> uh, when you least expect it. You know, it's just something you got to just be ready for at all times. 
Um, okay, so uh, you guys, I want to say thank you to everyone. We've gone a little bit over the time, but it's fine because there's a lot of information being, again, if you are in the Discord, redsea.com slash Discord, uh, the webcast section will have a lot of different things. But there is, um, I think before we go, there is another question. I thought there was. Maybe I'm wrong. I am wrong. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so uh, thank you to everyone who has joined us and uh, we'll see you on the next one, which will be very soon. Thanks everybody. <laughs>